Thank you, guys. This is your host, Tina, founder of Boomerang, joined by my amazing co-host, Aaron, host and founder of Altcoin Daily. Today, the plan is to explore two sides of popular crypto arguments. So for the sake of the debate, we might have to play the devil's advocate sometimes. We're trying to present you with facts, opinions, perspectives from all sides of the spectrum so you can decide for yourself. Please go ahead and click that bubble on the right bottom corner of this space. Give us a boost with a like, comment, retweet. Let's get more friends in here. Let's get this show going. Um, and you guys, um, well, Aaron, what's up? Hey, what's going on, everybody? Yeah, guys, share this space. We're going for the next hour hard. It's going to be way more fun uh, if we get as many people in here as possible. And, you know, if you... Uh, comment underneath this space or, or retweet it uh, and you want to come up later hopefully we can bring you up but that's what we're looking for as tina or boomerang just said yeah exactly we're going to be playing a little devil's advocate here maybe some of us obviously nobody loves you you can check the nest up to see all the different topics we're doing obviously nobody loves cbdc's but like one of us is going to take the cbd side cbdc side the other one obviously anti and just go down the list you know social fi ordinals top is in ethereum etf versus xrp this is kind of what we're doing today tina i love it and aaron i have to um welcome our guest james from invest answers james you're one of my favorites when it comes to market analysis i love the models you provide the data averages stats really putting things into a mathematical perspective so it's great to have you here today i'm, ec I'm ecstatic to we were able to get you on finally we were waiting for you last week but i'm happy that you're here um so welcome thank you so much for the invite this will be fun and thank you for inviting me again of course and aaron what do you think should we just ride into it today or do you have anything for us um yeah so who do we have on stage with us we have invest answers and we have action and i think we'll be bringing in more people up as we go uh but does the does the context of the space make make sense to you? Invest answers, James. Are you understanding what we're doing? Yeah, I read the agenda real quick. <laughs> um, there's certain things I I know a little bit about. Um, social fi would not be one of my strengths at all. And, but, and it's so new. I mean, it's like yeah. some of this stuff is just big picture type stuff, mm -hmm. like just thinking out into the future. Kind of you know nobody knows for sure. But uh, Tina, which which topic are we going to start at? Um, I mean, we could go from the nested uh, tweet up there so we don't get confused and skip over one. So let's do start with Ethereum ETF versus XRP ETF. Um, let's hear the thoughts. Do you think it's more likely that we're going to see um, Ethereum ETF first or XRP? Do you think it's going to be this year? Um, any thoughts? Right. So I'll be taking the side of XRP ETF and you'll be taking the side of Ethereum ETF. Yeah, we can do that. And everybody on the panel, you can jump in the conversation at any time you like. It's a free flowing panel. So don't worry about raising hands or anything like that. Just if you have anything to add, go ahead and um, join the conversation. Um, so Aaron, go. I mean, there's plenty of different things we can, uh, you know, start at for, I mean, what's the biggest barrier to entry uh, to get any sort of financial products for any of these crypto assets? It's the regulatory clarity. Now, XRP certainly has that regulatory clarity, that's for sure. Now you can say Ethereum has the regulatory clarity, and that is true versus the larger market, but XRP 100% for sure has definite regulatory clarity. It is not a security. The judge said himself it is a commodity. So like, wouldn't, wouldn't you suspect that uh, XRP ETF is likely? Well, I have to push back because I think that um, Ethereum, you know, having been longstanding position as the second largest cryptocurrency by market cap and, you know, it's widespread adoption in DeFi and non-fungible tokens and all the software applications that it, it um, enables people to use. I think that Ethereum should be the one that's up next. And I am very um, I don't think that it's going to happen right after each other. I think we're going to see a long time until we even see the Ethereum ETF come up. Um, we see talks about it already. And the good thing about Ethereum is that at least 
with every other ETF that you've seen got, gotten approved, we've seen that there was a futures ETF approved first. And so Ethereum is positioned in a better uh, way possible for an um, spot ETF rather than an XRP that's not even there yet. So I think XRP has more kind of steps to complete to even join this. Anybody else, you can add your thoughts as well. Yeah. And um, go ahead, go. Oh, ahead. yeah. I was, I was just going to say because Grayscale won that case because there was a Bitcoin futures ETF, I think the same thing is gonna happen with ETH first. Um, and I think the deadline for the ETH is May, I think, or the summer, but yeah, that's just my thoughts. I think ETH is gonna be first and then XRP next. Yeah, interesting. Uh, you know, just because, and again, I'm playing devil's advocate here. I hope everybody gets an ETF, but uh, just because uh, we have futures contracts for Ethereum, yes, they should be able to create uh, spot contracts as well, but they don't have to just because they have the futures contracts doesn't mean they for sure will. Now, something that Tina slash Boomerang brought up in the very be very beginning as she kind of prefaced what she was about to say, she brought up a few things, but one of it was Ethereum's uh, history in the market. Weren't you talking about that, Tina, that Ethereum has this uh, this long history in the market? Yeah, I think the tech and just mature, maturity of the product actually matters. I think it's positioned in a better, you know, possible way. And uh, what year was Ethereum created about? 2016. <laughs> I think it was 2014, even even better. 14, and, yeah. and, and what year was uh, XRP created about? Oh, that's interesting. Anybody, anybody <laughs> know the year? Real quick. <laughs> it was <laughs> well, eight years I ago. I think that's worse to your point because it's been around for a longer time and Ethereum's performed better. That's true. I mean, here's the thing I would say. XRP might get an ETF first, but it doesn't mean it's going to outperform Ethereum because Ethereum has much better tokenomics than XRP at the moment, the way I understand it. Ethereum is deflationary. Often XRP is inflationary. Um, but I mean, to you know, if there's one coin that has market history besides Bitcoin that's still around today, it is XRP. Gary, what are you thinking? And anybody can jump in at any time. Yeah, I think it's interesting uh, commentary about the the length of time that XRP as a company based in the United States launching a token. I, I did do an interview with Roger Veer, and I know he's a major investor in the origin story of XRP. Um, when it comes to which one like like ethereum has its history of etc or the original ethereum and the dow hack and then basically the movement of the founder to a, a fork uh I, I wonder if that's going to be any kind of issue about um about regulatory compliance and things like that like you know the the origin story so i don't see proposals for etfs of btc forks uh but there is a lot of commentary obviously because it's second position in market cap uh, about Ethereum being uh, potentially an ETF. So I'm just confused about, you know, not just our sentiment as crypto investors, but what will regulatory authority consider first? And here's the thing, uh, Gary, Tina, James, Action, Act, Altcoin. Here's the thing, you know, we can speculate up here. You know, I think this is going to happen. I think this is going to happen. And as investors and just regular people, that's what we should do. But some people are actually in this world every day, actually, you know, rubbing elbows with uh, the likes of Larry Fink, other financial giants. Person I want to bring up is the chief investment officer at Valkyrie. You guys heard of him? Surely he would know what he's talking about, don't you think, Boomerang? Yeah, definitely. Let's get him up here. Um, I, I wish he was around. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you just saw them coming and I was like, oh, yes. Could it be perfect? <laughs> he doesn't have. But hang I did want to also course. bring up Aaron. Um, and I didn't even make my point, Tina. I didn't even make oh, my point. Oh, my bad. Go ahead. I just go wanted ahead. to, like, wouldn't you think that person would know what he was talking about? The chief investment officer at Valkyrie. Valkyrie was one of the ones who just launched the Bitcoin ETF, I believe. So obviously, the chief investment officer at Valkyrie would know what he's talking about. And I bring that up because if you follow us, uh, if you follow crypto in general, you probably saw last week CIO of Valkyrie. McClurg, Steve McClurg is his name. Um, he says, you know, I think the XRP might be first before the Ethereum ETF. And he even said, you know, I can talk about this because we're, this is not something we're pursuing, the XRP ETF. But he's just saying, you know, I think that because it has that regulatory clarity, you know, we could see it first. So that's his opinion. Interesting. I do agree with that. And I actually was listening to him on his space with Mario Spaces. And um, 
I don't know if I like if you're not even going to take the effort to be adding this to your portfolio for your ETFs. Like, I don't know where that kind of argument comes from that he thinks, you know, Ethereum is going, I mean, XRP is going to be first. So I kind of just need to know like where, where what he's basing that on. But it, it is uh, the regulatory clarity is definitely a big deal for XRP. And it was a big deal for the whole space as a general. I think it did us all a favor. Um, but also Ethereum is probably the second other coin that Gary Gensler hasn't been able to completely say as a security. I mean, after its move to proof of stake, there was kind of a little bit of, um, you know, speculation around it because he came out and kind of had a quote similar to, um, you know, a proof of stake could be a security, but he never confirmed that Ethereum is This is Gary Gensler um, you're talking about? Exactly. But he never confirmed that Ethereum is, you know, for sure a security. But I think that even to the argument that people make that because now it is on POS, it's more likely to be a security and might not get the clarity um, from the regulatory perspective. Um, I think that another good thing that it you know, it brings another benefit that the update uh, upgrade brought um, is in terms of energy efficiency, security, and potentially, you know, influencing the regulatory decisions because now it's aligning more with the current ESG investing trends. And I think for an ETF to get approved, they take those things into account. And who and which cryptocurrency was really propagating the ESG in crypto narrative way before, you know, Ethereum switched to proof of stake? Which crypto was that? It's XRP, baby. They, the Bitcoiners complain all the time about they're spending money to say Bitcoin's bad for the environment and XRP's good. Uh, 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 invest answers. Any, any take? I got, I got a good anyway. take here. Here's the thing. Like, you're just trying to dunk on Tina. And I think that, you know, it's just the fact that she's not bringing up the fact that the CFTC has already accepted those, you know, future trading ETFs. That means that they don't consider this thing a security at all. They're already calling it a commodity if they're allowing this thing to be traded. So... There is a, a regulatory oversight already, and they have already cleared it. I mean, maybe you can say that it's implicit because, um, you know, the, the SEC didn't fight them on it or whatever it is, but it's there. It's already happening. So this is a hop and a skip away for a spot. I agree with that action, and I brought that up, but unfortunately, you know, there are people that still would take the argument and saying uh, Gary Gensler never came out like he mentioned Bitcoin in the same context, say Ethereum is also safe, and that's why we kind of look at the other, you know, factors, uh, but I think in general, Gary Gensler, the way he's been doing it, it's regulation by enforcement, you know, they've just been going to battles again and again in court, and the way that they're doing it is obviously not um, efficient or justified in any way, but that's the way they're going with it, so I'm not sitting here waiting for him to name one coin one by one for me i'm more looking at the fundamentals and from what we have kind of deciding for myself but james would love to hear from you where do you stand on this topic yeah well i speak data and data sometimes can be very offensive so uh, <laughs> i i don't mean to offend since i'm new to this crew uh first of all you know when i look at ethereum it's the backbone actually let's go back to the dates first I think the mainnet live date for XRP was 2012 and uh, mainnet live date for ETH was 2015, if I recall. But I could be wrong, but I think I'm right. Now, ETH is the backbone of all DeFi. It's the 800-pound gorilla. And XRP, you know, it's kind of questionable what they do. For the longest time last year, there was like 10,000 daily active users. Now it has less daily active users than Cardano. Um, the whale holdings are incredible. It's been around for, what, 12 years and the inflation is still crazy and they got 51 billion tokens in escrow um and it hasn't gone anywhere i like things that go up in value so i'm, I'm not an xrp fan and i know i'm probably making a lot of enemies here but that's just the data that i look at eth has the futures and that means it's a shoe in for the next spot etf no doubt in my mind and, and based on some of tina's arguments i think she's a gary gensler fan that's what i'm taking away <laughs> I actually wanted to tell James that I've crushed many people in the space using your video that Solana versus Cardano. So that's where I get my data from, people. <laughs> okay, that's just data. Let's, you know, it's uh, let's do let's do final thoughts on this topic and yeah. move on to is Great. the top in. If anybody has something, why in the world would anybody launch a ETF or a token that nobody's trading? Do you want to lose money on this deal? Uh, I, I don't think so. Yes, well said. 
<clears throat> Boom. All right, I'll take it, guys. Listen, obviously, I took the unpopular opinion. And for this next topic, I will also be taking the unpopular opinion. I'll say the top is in. Anybody disagree? You like to. <laughs> Let's hear from the audience. Um, if you think the top is in, thumbs up. If you think it's not, thumbs down. And then let's hear from the experts up here. <laughs> Well, I mean, wow, actually, I, I, not that many thumbs sure, down. I'll, 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 <laughs> give, I'll give an argument. I'll give an argument to start us off. And on, I, on, you know, I'm on my show all the time. I make the arguments to why there's a future for crypto. So again, taking the the devil's advocate for the sake of conversation, guys. The top is in the biggest catalyst. One of the biggest catalysts, if not the biggest catalyst for this cycle, already happened. And there was a big run up for the last year, year and a half. But now that catalyst is behind us. The top is in. I'm talking about the BlackRock spot Bitcoin ETF. I think it's just a buy the rumor, sell the news event and also Grayscale, to my understanding, it's the first time they were able to kind of cash out. So right now there's a lot of sales going on with that. So I think maybe right now the top is in, but not the cycle top. And from what I understand or have seen, you know, after the halving, it's about six to 18 months before there's all time highs again. So. I'm kind of on that boat, meaning the latest we see the all time high again is October 2025. So that's, that's well, what, what catalysts? Well, I mean, all the, the biggest catalyst is behind us. BlackRock already listed it. What catalysts do we have going forward? Well, the halving right in April. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's in April. And typically from the halvings in the well, previously, every six to 18 months after a halving, we see all time highs. The only difference now is we have the ETF. So there could be some slight differences like you know history doesn't repeat itself but it does rhyme now do you agree that each having matters less and less for like a supply shock sorry as in in bitcoin's first 10 years the majority of the bitcoin supply got mined into the market in the first 10 years you know what 17 18,000 in total has been mined so far in bitcoin's next 100 years it'll be a fraction so that's supply shock will be less significant. Do, yeah. Do we agree? And, yeah, absolutely. And I have hundreds of Bitcoin that I can't get a hold of. So I'm sure there's tons of other people that also have the same. So yeah, supply shock, that's been locked up. I don't know yeah, but this time the having is a little bit different because we also have these ETFs that got approved and, you know, that in combination. So the demand is hugely going up. We don't even know how high the demand is going to go because it's only starting. The marketing of these 11 companies is just starting. The education for the masses is just starting. So we don't know how much this demand is going to go up. We just know that obviously uh, this is a solid asset. It's the best performing asset of last year. So it, if people get educated and get kind of like have a way to have exposure to this asset in their investments i don't see why uh, that wouldn't you know just drive up the demand up crazy while we're also going into a ha year of a halving which is what it's going to you know drop the supply down by half to about 450 i think globally so their demand is going up crazy but the supply is coming down so that i feel like that should just give us a very good scenario well, who's left to list it? BlackRock already listed. Who's left to buy it? Elon Musk already bought it. Now I'm using Richard Hart's arguments from last cycle. Oh, right, Gary. Oh, Gary. Do, Gary. Do, do not poke said. Gary here. Do not poke Gary. Yeah, it's, it's Aaron. You're very funny. I love the way you, you try and uh, rile people up. Let me just say a couple of words on this. This is more than a halving. This is, would be a triple or quadruple halving, if anything, for the following reasons. First of all, we have never had a having going into diminishing supply like now first of all second we have never well what do you mean by that what do you mean going into diminishing supply we've never had that before what do you so mean? before in the past typically there was increasing supply of bitcoin now for the first time ever the supply is going down which means the long-term holders are holding a lot more and more of the supply it's going up and up I think the long-term holders now own 70% of the actual Bitcoin supply, short-term holders of 30%. That's never happened at this stage of the halving before. And that's only going to go get more extreme because people are not going to sell until a year after the halving. So your colleague on the other line was dead right on that one. So we don't know what's going on. Second of all, Bitcoin has been classified as an asset by traditional finance. I'm a TradFi guy. This is huge. Third, we have players that have just entered the market that took 78,000 Bitcoin out of the system 
in four days, okay? Yes, I know there's recycling from grayscale out, but that's about a third to a quarter of the total demand. So if you imagine uh, grayscale, uh, say, say 78,000 is being consumed by these 11 ETFs, 26,900 is coming out of grayscale over four days. So net, you could call it 50,000 is being pulled out of the actual environment. The amount of supply issued per day is 900. That's going to 450 on April 19th, 90 days away. <laughs> which is bonkers. Now, my math tells me that if the rate of acquisition of Bitcoin continues like it has done over the last four days, that means the ETS will take 3.26 million Bitcoin out of the system in 2024, which isn't even possible because there isn't that much available. There's less than 1.8 million on exchanges right now. And I estimate even if I take a quarter of that, you get about a million 850,000 Bitcoin. And most of the, the amount of Bitcoin that's going to be produced in 2024 is 216,000. And we're talking a million at least will be consumed by the ETFs. So it is going to be a bonkers bull run. And what's happening right now is really bizarre because it could be, you know, the psychology of buy the rumor, sell the news. People don't know how to react to this. They're like pissed off. It's not at $100,000 already. So they're saying, screw this. I'm going into altcoins. Uh, or the market's being manipulated somehow with OTC transactions. Or the but, but what happens when there's not enough Bitcoin out there? Like there's not enough being produced for the people that want to buy it. What happens at that point? Price goes to the moon, literally. It's a perfect economic experiment of supply and demand. And it'll be very exciting to watch. I'm sitting here with my popcorn, maybe a bottle of wine. It's going to be fun. And we will get $5,000 candles. We've had two $3,000 candles this year so far. We will get a $5,000 candle next when things... When the OTC gets drained and the miners have sold all their gear, which they just dumped a huge amount over the last four days, then we're going to get that crunch. And then it's going to be fun. Mark my words. And I, my I, tend thoughts, to agree. I tend to agree with uh, the sentiment about positive price action. I think that there will be some differentiation because of the ETF uh, you know, fiduciary responsible type of entities may have a pre preference or premium on quote unquote virgin BTC bought directly from miners. I think that that, you know, that being seen in the market and probably what's promoted as spot uh, may bring up the price of what everybody else holds. Like you were saying, the 70% of BTC held by long-term versus the short-term players. Yeah. Uh, I think, so again, price sentiment is in general, in my view, positive. When I talk to family offices or people that are, you know, pseudo celebrity, you know, entering uh, cryptocurrency or entering Bitcoin, they're not self custody. They, they, they put millions of dollars into it and they want to call a broker. They want to call a central, uh, you know, centralized entity and things like that. And still the price that they're referencing is what they see on coin market cap and other things. So I think it's going to be uh, price positive for lots of different reasons. Hells yeah. And, and if we take an, the gold ETF as an analog, that could mean, and remember, gold is not hard like Bitcoin. Bitcoin is as scarce as can be. If there is anything like the continuous flow of money like we had at the gold ETF, Bitcoin could go up straight for eight years. There may be no more bear markets. There's probably a 15% chance of that happening. So bear that in mind, too. I, I do think it took like a year or two before gold because there was a dip after it launched yeah. and then it went up hardcore. I do, do think the gold ETF took a year or two. About six months. And the reason for that is financial advisor experts, they have to do the research. They have to take their time to learn about this new asset, gold ETF. And then they have to educate their clients and then the clients have to pull the trigger. And that's the six month time lag you're seeing there. Uh, so it seems it seems like everybody's bullish up here. I guess you guys are right. Everybody's bullish. I guess <laughs> higher highs away. That's usually how it works. Top is not in. And I'll bet you a Bitcoin on that, Aaron, if you want. I actually have a question for Invest Answers <laughs> yeah. from the comments. Okay. Um, DeFiBank.eth wants to know, you know, aside from what we presented, the XRP or Ethereum ETF, they want to know, based off of your quant analytics, wh which crypto do you think deserves to be the next ETF? So uh, the way the SEC will do it, they are pushed around by the money, the money runners, which are the big institutions. you got Franklin Templeton today and yesterday pumping Solana. They're saying, hey, we need blockchain. you got Larry Fink, biggest money runner on the planet, over 10 trillion in AUM, he's saying we need to tokenize everything and we need a fast blockchain to do that. 
So all roads are pointing to one chain, which I will not mention, but you guys should know what it is, and that'll be the ETF that runs after Ethereum sometime early 2025. Is there anybody on stage who agrees with my side that the top is in? Anybody? Any arguments for that? I mean, for the short term, right? I think it's in. We might go cycle down. Cycle top, cycle top. Yeah, sorry, buddy. Yeah, Aaron, if you're so confident, why aren't you going short? That's a good question, James. <laughs> you know, I'm so confident that this is an interesting conversation, which is why I had the balls to take this side. You are. Okay? I know. Should exactly. I, exactly. Can I, like I just that. take I your that. side? I'm going to go on your side, James. I'm on your side now. Uh, action's on the other side. I'm on your side. It's very important that me and Action are not the same side. Um, because with the whole Bitcoin ecosystem would just explode. But um, yeah, we've reached the top for that maybe, but you know what we have not reached the top for? Uh, gaming tokens, and that's the end of my argument. Yeah, what's your, what's right, your favorite gaming token? I know nothing about video games. I've never played a video game in my life. What is a good gaming token? Wow, so my segue worked. That was amazing. Oh, you're trying to pump a coin here? You have three <laughs> sentences to name your favorite gaming token, then we're moving on to Bitcoin. And I'll I'll okay, I'll fine, trap coin, that's it. I missed that. I did it, trap coin. I'm done. I said I had three seconds. Okay. Three sentences, but. Oh, sorry, sorry. Well, I think there's a lot of games coming out now that are like really intriguing, like Off the Grid and Shrapnel, that are going to be really huge. They're putting a huge amount of money and in investment and networking and connections that they have. And that's uh, three. The, the public sentiment. <laughs> Cake time. That's Shrapnel for you. on Avalanche was his pick. Shrapnel <laughs> Thanks, on Doug. Avalanche. And I hear that yes. is a great game. Um, Tina, would you like to move on to the Bitcoin ordinals debate versus ordinals on any other crypto chain? I think it's time, and honestly, I feel bad for you. I think this time I will take the opposite side of what I believe in. So I'll go, I'll be the devil's advocate, and I will say that ordinals are ruined in Bitcoin. Uh, you know, Bitcoin, what is meant for right now is a store of value. And, um, you know, this is um, kind of cluttering up, you know, the uh, block space and well, making the doing, fees we go doing, up. And are, we, are we doing ordinals are bad for Bitcoin or ordinals um, versus being good for Bitcoin or ordinals uh, are better than ETH ordinals or NFTs? Which one? I think we're just doing it. I mean, I could go either way, honestly. You um, tell me. You tell me. Want. I think let's just do it. Are ordinals bad for, I mean, the, the you know, the normal Bitcoin maxi argument, are, are ordinals even okay or ethical to be on Bitcoin or good for Bitcoin? Um, yeah. So you're taking the side of the Bitcoin maxi is that this is spam on the Bitcoin chain. We don't need it. We don't want it. Exactly. My favorites. <laughs> so um, should I just, yeah, I guess I'll go on a monologue about why they're not good. You know, like I said, Bitcoin is a store of value and it's, you know, they want to kind of preserve its simplicity and limitations to storing and transferring value they think should be preserved at all costs. So, um, you know, we've had issues with people people kind of trying to build non-financial use cases on Bitcoin and um, why was it not good because you know like obviously what Basie did to Ethereum causing fees to go up is the same thing it's an issue that you have where you, all this block, state, block space is not being crowded with stuff that is not finance related causing volatility in the system that's really supposed to be predictable so come at me. <laughs> Well, let me ask you something, Tina. Would you say that same thing to Donald Trump, who just decided to move on over from Polygon to Bitcoin to launch his next NFT collection on Bitcoin as an ordinal? Honestly, Donald Trump's um, order, I mean, NFTs, I don't think they ever had a use case or a utility. So I think he could do whatever he wants. And if anything, like, I think ordinals are better because he can't really like people. There's no way that people can really get scammed in any way. You know, whatever art he puts on and inscribes on the ordinal and for whoever, like, I don't know. Um, if everybody's kind of familiar with ordinals, but basically what they are is every Bitcoin consists of about 100 million Satoshi. So ordinals protocol allows for these sats to kind of send individually with optional extra data attached to them. So this data could be text, images, videos, but the ordinals protocol really was put into place to give these sats like numbers. So they know if you like took from the bottom of the stack or, you know, um, the top of the stack just to kind of like put them in order. But anyways, um, it got really popular popular with like taproot wizards or other um, ordinal projects that are putting art on top of these block spaces, which some people think, you know, is a waste of a block space. They don't think it should be messed with in that way. And Bitcoin should stay as kind of like a store of value. 
I wanted to bring up uh, the security uh, argument uh, for, you know, the future for the miners in the future. But uh, Gary, did you want to jump in? Yeah, kind of the same thing. I've sit in different spaces with Eric Wall and Udi as they kind of battle Luke, the cat eater. Uh, core dev so uh, over the past month or something right so it's always interesting you know it becomes a little bit like excitement it's it, it gets the animal spirits going about like what's the what's the price action going to be um you know the narrative like uh tina was saying is you know what pays for the security of the network when a lot of crypto is sequestered into etfs fiduciary responsible long-term holders never sellers right so if you're going to have transactions uh basically paid for by miners uh, these types of use cases are interesting. Uh, you have, uh, I think it was Satoshi. Again, I'm not fully schooled, so I may mess up the vocabulary. But wasn't there some reference to uh, 2008, 2009, you know, like uh, fiat, the, the doom and gloom of fiat, even by Satoshi on the blockchain of Bitcoin? So it hasn't had a previous history, uh, you know, inscriptions, ordinals and so forth. So it's interesting that 2017's Crypto Kitties has finally come to uh, Bitcoin instead of Ethereum. I think that that's an interesting narrative. There, there, people are going to speculate on, uh, you know, is price going to go up because of ordinals? And I think in general it will. And doesn't this, isn't this good for the long-term security of Bitcoin, where it's like before ordinals were invented, there wasn't as big of demand to get that block space as there is after ordinals? Yeah, yeah kind of the same thing. I, I hear people paying four or five Bitcoin for a single Satoshi that's been, uh, you know, so ordained as to be no, no longer fungible. It changes its fungibility, supposedly. Uh, and again, I think that the ETF fiduciary responsible one to two percent of uh, of someone's portfolio put into the into the asset of Bitcoin, they're going to choose Virgin uh, Virgin uh, mind BTC and kind of keep it away from this. Maybe even maybe even separate as far as like the ocean pools and stuff like that that uh, Luke's been putting up. So yeah, I, I think in general, it's good uh, in general. And um, uh, the market's going to decide, uh, do you, here's the question, do you want to be permissioned on what you spend your dollar on? If you're gonna say that it's, it's a form of cash or store of value, then you know who is to make a decision about how you use your dollar? Um, it's kind of the same thing with Bitcoin for me. Like uh, I would love people to buy coffee with it or buy a house with it. Um, but it, you know, it has to have value and right now ordinals are really promoting the value, uh, as well. Yeah. And I've, I've got a very capitalistic stake on this. If you don't mind me interjecting, first of all, uh, anything that brings users to the network is a good thing that increases the value of the network. So that's good. Second of all, the ordinals are driving the miners revenue through the wazoo, which is a huge concern of mine in 2023. I thought the minor half the miners weren't going to make it after April 2024, but the ordinals changed that. So really good there. And yeah, block space has been full, but the network itself has to develop and it has to get a little bit faster. So throwing these challenges at it is a net positive as well. And also I think it does help a little bit with decentralization as well. More users, more miners, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my simple three points on the subject, net, net, all good. Wow. Let, let me is, let me let me ask, go, go ahead. Yeah, just one more thing, since it's still on the topic that was mentioned before by Aaron. Uh, so you had said something about uh, I think it was Polygon or the deployer for the Trump NFTs uh, last cycle, and then there's been a more recent cycle, and then moving over to uh, you know an ordinal version. Uh, that's interesting. I'm actually going to be at that event, uh, Mar-a-Lago, with Trump as a guest also. So like, yeah, there's an open invitation for one of the because you bought twins. the NFTs. That's why you're going to be there. Yeah, yeah. So no, 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 no. So I'm, I bought the NFTs, but if they had been on Bitcoin, I would have bought an ordinal version is what I'm saying. Uh, but is that why so you got it, invited to Trump's place? Because I know originally one of the prizes for getting his NFTs where you get dinner with him or other stuff. Is that why you're going to Mar-a-Lago? Yes. So there's the VIP level, which is a per two guests at the dinner. And uh, that's one of the things that's going on now inside of our sub community of crypto is uh, trying to find out who wants to go as a guest. So it's an open invitation to one of the, uh, the altcoin twins. Oh, wow. Thank you. I would love to go. Uh, does I did want to add what I don't get about it also is, you know, my thing with NFTs, I'm a big fan of NFTs. Aaron knows this. And 
Boomerang also, you know, our product has a lot to do with the underlying technology under the NFTs, you know, providing tools and stuff in the space so that wallets can connect with each other. But what my problem is with ordinals is I love NFTs because of the programmability aspect of them, because of the smart contract aspect of it. And I can see a lot of real world use cases to it. And yes, I do agree with James's point where, you know, now there's more interest on the Bitcoin network, but when it comes to the masses, I mean, even NFTs with an amazing technology that was on Ethereum with programmability and all of that um, smart contract function, we didn't even really get into the masses that much with that. So I don't understand why Bitcoin ordinals that lack that kind of technology as well would be doing better. Um, so that's just my two cents to kind of finish playing the devil's advocate. <laughs> because it's more permanent, more secure, more scarce. But you think that, but the thing is, it's just you put it on the block space and yes, it, it gets inscribed forever. And the argument for Ethereum NFTs is that it's stored somewhere else. So if they stop paying for the IPFS or something, it could go away. But honestly, if that NFT has been traded enough on chain, there's always a record of it on chain. You can always see what it was holding before. So I don't think that's a huge argument when it comes to. I think it is in 2021. This is a story that reveals my life, guys. In 2021, I suffered a great hardship. I bought an NFT. I bought a few NFTs from this collection. It was called Crypto Chicks. Thought they were going to be as big as World of Women. They weren't. Something happened with one of the NFTs. It got stolen or something. And all of a sudden, the team changed the one that got stolen to put like a big like void red symbol over the picture. And I was like, what the hell? They could just change this at any time? Like, what's this is a big turnoff for me. Crypto chicks would have been on ordinals. I think they'd be number one today. You know what? I, I, I hear... got your attention out of all the NFT projects. <laughs> right, Crypto right. Chicks. Tell me about that, Tina. But I, I hear Gary, I hear Aaron both saying that I feel this way. I, guys, facts don't care about your feelings, right? I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, the truth of the matter is it's the network is not going to be more secure because you have or, you know ordinals being launched. Miners are going to mine. I've been mining and I'm going to continue to mine regardless of what's going on in the network. And yeah, you're just increasing gas fees, essentially, is what, what's going on here. The network is becoming way expensive for anybody to trade on. And, you know, I think it's a net negative, ultimately, when it comes down to why am I going to trade Bitcoin on Bitcoin cheap? Like, I'm, I'm not going to use that. I'm going to go to an ETF because it's going to be cheaper for me to buy Bitcoin there. That's where we're headed. We're headed to, you know, the, the inflation of the network as a whole where gas fees are taken over. And soon enough, we're going to be proof of stake on Bitcoin just because people can't take it anymore. Easy, I, I'll buddy. disagree with that. Let me let me make a cultural statement disagreeing. Uh, you know, human beings have been around a long time as a society, and yet we don't all speak the same language. We haven't all chosen to be Chinese language or English language even today. So, like, there's going to be cultures that choose a network for whatever feature set or nostalgia or mother tongue that they've been born into as far as the crypto, crypto experience. If they were born into Bitcoin and uh, in 2015, 16, 17, uh, and then they basically have, hey, let's introduce this other feature set of what Ethereum offers. You know, some may decide to migrate, some may not. Uh, there has already been effectively $4 million Bitcoin because uh, 2000 Ethereum was purchased with one Bitcoin when Ethereum launched. So you already have $4 million Bitcoin if you look at it in that view. But people won't, won't necessarily shift their culture. So... Uh, when you say something like it's just spamming up the network, sure, it makes transactions expensive or slow. Sure, that's not going to change. Uh, people will still choose because of their religiosity. Let me just say that uh, of, of what culture they're born into. If they're if they're Bitcoin because it has everything that they need, they're going to overpay if you, from some people's perspective. Uh, you know, going to overpay for basically that participation. Uh, other chains come along. There's a broadening of the market. Animal spirits still go where the money flows. So, like, I don't think it's harmful that Bitcoin becomes boggy or, or expensive. It just means that there's distribution uh, across more people adopting crypto as a well. whole. Your guys, statement. Guys, yeah. appreciate it, everybody. We're going we're gonna to move on. The next subject is CBDCs, pro or against. I'd like to encourage, guys, we've never had so many people requesting to speak. Like, we're getting crazy amounts of people who want to jump up here and give their opinion. And we're bringing more and more people up. Guys, give uh, Invest Answers a follow. Give Gary a follow. Give Boomerang a follow. Hell, even give Ben Action Shapiro a follow. Facts don't care about your feelings. And Doug and, and Altcoin and uh, Money Gang, who hasn't spoken yet. But guys, Tina, you want to move on to CBDCs? Yeah, I think it's time. Wanna, which side are you taking? 
I want to take the popular opinion that CBDCs are good. That we need these. Okay, we need these buddy. <laughs> oh, good. That's what I came here for, actually, is for that. I'm, I'm, I got to join you on this one. Any, well, who else thinks CBDCs are good? Anybody? It's action. Uh, action. I'll be with also, you all the way. Um, did you know that it's also a very cool club where punks play in New York? It's really cool. Aaron, are you trying to get yourself murdered? <laughs> like, literally? And the best answer is, James, somebody <laughs> has to do this. This would be a boring space if we just all came up here and said, hey, higher highs, CBDCs are bad. Hey, rather than just Actually, make fun of me, James, point. why don't you engage with my arguments? For instance, CBDCs means increased payment efficiency and means yes. deterring criminal activity. It means potentially reducing net transaction costs, particularly for remittance payments, cross-border payments around the world, which should become much easier. And actually, that benefits low-income uh, type households. So, I mean, do you disagree? Uh, the, the problem is, can you trust governments? It all comes back to that. And the answer is, as we've learned since 2020, you cannot. So once the government controls your wallet and your cash, it's game over. Whatever, whoever is in control, control, control your money which can control your decisions. If you decide not to get a certain, maybe, syringe full of something, they'll say, sorry, we're cutting you off. You got no money well, now. Let me ask you or this, you James. Can't fly. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Do CBDCs deter criminal activity, yes or no? No. Criminals can figure out a way. They can, tr they can barter for crime. They can murder okay. somebody for a bag of cocaine. They don't need CBDCs. Don't worry about do that. Do CBDCs increase payment efficiency? Yes or no? Yes, yes, they do. Thank you. But but the problem is though, the TradFi banks, the JP Morgans of the world, they will control the CBDCs and they'll take their pound of flesh from it. So I wouldn't say it will increase effectiveness and efficiency so much. James, we can let him have that little one. <laughs> <laughs> I give him half. I give him half a point. Okay, Aaron, hit me one more time. Sounds okay, like well, like. I don't know. I mean, this would all probably only work if you were uh, more of a progressive, which I just assume everybody in crypto is like libertarians. But, you know, there's uh, stimulus checks like uh, universal basic income is coming. A, C a CBDC would be perfect for that. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what I, one of my biggest fears is, you know, it's kind of like Javier Millet said at Davos today is the whole West is driving down a road to socialism at 100 miles an hour. And it's a real problem for everything. So. I believe in freedom of everything, and I do not like Orwellian spy coins. Period, or any to, or any crypto chain that supports them. And, and we kind of XRP. We went through my biggest arguments, so uh, Gary, you can you can jump in, but take it away, guys. Why are CBDCs bad? I guess. Uh, well, you know, again, these these are things that are always on Twitter. We can find the same kind of content. I was going to agree with you, just to take the opposite side. Well, it's always presented, you know, when the AI takes over or aliens uh, actually reveal themselves, they're going to need CBDCs to control. So like, uh, you know, the higher powers, you want to call it? Sure. Uh, CBDCs are going to be a norm. Uh, on the other side, if I am going to take it, it is humans are going to continue to be human, uh, which means that there's always going to be gray markets. There's always going to be black markets. There's always going to be barter or handshake deals. You know, CBDC uh, permissioned uh, spend. Uh, you can you, right now you can talk to the Tates and see how much their wealth has been able to, uh, you know, been taken away from them, whether it's property and title of real estate and say that you own this. No, you don't. Uh, you're I hardly account, think no, you the don't. Tates are representative of the average person. Yeah, but I'm just saying in general, like the idea that you're going to be off grid living in, in a cabin in the woods and spending your your non CBDC barter tools like like I'm just it's a long topic, but I, I was just joking about uh AI is our only salvation. No, but honestly, like, it just doesn't make sense to me. Why come and take when we have something like Bitcoin, which is decentralized and uh, no one controls it, no single point of failure. And then we come and imagine a Bitcoin, another type of currency like Bitcoin, but this one is controlled. It's, you know, permissioned. It's uh, regulated by the government. So more power over your daily life and economic activity, where you spend your money, how much of it you can spend, forcing people to even maybe spend during recession, you you know, with capital controls and cyber attack risks, I just don't see anything good about this. I read a study that said basically uh, people compare CB CBDCs to having um, in-home government surveillance cameras, and that just sounds hor horrific. And I think that CBDCs at their core are horrific, you know. Um, 
it's just like I feel like it just takes away a lot of our basic rights, and mm. I'm not for it. Talk about logical well, fallacies, and I think I only want to go into this because James is so good at it, and, and Tina, the stuff you're talking about is pretty good, so I'm going to go with Aaron on this one just for funsies, but there's a huge logical fallacy with what you guys are talking about here. Are you saying CBDCs are essentially a social score? Like, that's a huge leap. You're essentially saying that you're going to have to have a new wallet? Like, that's not what we're talking about here. Come we're talking on, about a currency. Dude. We're talking it's about a currency. It's already happening. It's happening. You're in right. USDT. That's exactly what it is, right? It's completely traceable, and they're printing money whenever they feel like it. So, what's the difference if the U.S. government went ahead and did it? The only difference is coming from the source instead of a third party. That's all it is. No, they will turn on payroll systems like ADP. They'll tie them into CBDCs. They'll track your social score. Well, you want to get paid? You want to get paid on Friday? Well, yeah. You know what? You got to enroll to this system. Then they have you buy the kahunas or the bulls, as Aaron would say earlier. So I don't mind using that word. Uh, I mean, I do that works. now. D doesn't so, everybody so, do that? So, like, so, not a taste, right? But everybody has a bank account that gets direct deposit. What's the difference? This is nothing new. I mean, if you look at a thousand years ago, medieval times, and the king can decide uh, to have first uh, first um, access to your wife, you know, uh, these kinds of like... Uh, rights of the monarchy or whatever like that kind of stuff is it's nothing different until it gets thrown over like you know rebellion uh things like that always change you know uh, uh systems so like I, I, again we can go down the road of it being yeah. electronic and feel like your first world but at the end of the day humans are going to human and when they do feel oppressed enough to give up treasure or blood they do that's what happens and exactly true or false, and, and, tr and, true or false and, and, wait wait true or false uh it's the same. It works the same way in the hex community. Richard Hart gets first access to the wives. True or false? Just kidding, Gary. This is obviously a joke. But just imagine a scenario where there's a political leader in the house, and he doesn't like a certain category of people. He will go to Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook and say, "Hey, give me the social data on these people," and then the world changes. The problem is when you hand over the power, everything can change very, very quickly. And that's how things go sideways real fast. And the problem is people don't understand how much the world is going to change over the next 24 months. It's going to be but, radically different. And that's the concern. I invited Money Gang up here to speak. He has something to say. What's your take, Money Gang? The pro CBDC kind of guy. Um, you know, I, I hear some conspiracy theories right here, especially invest answers. You know, saying that the government's not protecting us and not taking care of us. And, uh, you know, I, I take Jamie Diamond's um, opinion. Basically, but the speak blockchain. Speak right into that mic. I don't want to miss a word. Yeah. It's, um, you know, opinion whereby Bitcoin's pet rocks and maybe Satoshi just rugs us all when it gets to 100K. Who knows? Well, you know who else is for it? Money Green, um, AOC, um, Elizabeth Warren. You know, these are really oh my God. Well, AOC is <laughs> no, these are facts. Honestly, I've researched this. Um, you brought up Elizabeth Warren. I mean, I could kind of see some people do like AOC, but Elizabeth Warren, this is the wrong crowd, Boomerang. No, no, no. I'm just letting you know who likes it and who doesn't like it. And you drive conclusions from that. I am not giving you any conclusions. But I think to think that, you know, I mean, like, obviously, like, we like our government, but to that kind of want to give up power to the government and trust that they'll just do what's best for you i think no human has that should have that kind of fat power you know okay, I think if, we... if anybody here has lived through 2020 and they still trust their government they have a serious serious freaking problem and i've i've been tempted to do a poll on twitter to identify the correlation between bitcoiners and freedom i.e. what they think about what government mandates, wherever you are in the world. What happened in 2020 was a travesty and hopefully a wake-up call. But the problem is 60% of the people still don't get it. And they are like blind sheep. This is why Bitcoin is so important. And I just want to just say that out loud, Aaron. And I, When I hear people who are pro-CBDC, they have no fucking clue. And I've never cursed online in my life. But that's how passionate I am about this. Okay, I'm gonna go mute now. There so goes that's what spaces are for. It's fine, James. But um, yeah, go ahead, Aaron. I was just kidding around. I love it. Uh, I love the passion, James and Gary and everybody. Um, do you want to move on to the next topic, Tina? Yeah, I think you know that was a great outro of this topic by James. <laughs> we can Definitely. move on.
Yeah, guys, we're in the final, uh, you know, like seven minutes. So this might be the last one. We can speak as little as we need to on any of these ones. I guess the next one is crypto founders that are like very prominent. The Charles Hoskinsons, the uh, the Richard Hartz, the uh, the ones that are like at the forefront. Are they good for these cryptos or are they bad for these cryptos? Is that the topic, Tina? Yeah, we can move on to that topic. And if I'm going to start it, it's kind of the same that I was saying with the government. I just don't think that anybody should have that, you know, like not power shouldn't just be rested upon one or two people. I think a role of centrality and the greed around it, you see how much greed goes into when there's centrality and the danger that it poses to the culture of, you know, um, decentralized um, blockchain or crypto. And I think that, um, no matter you know what kind of i think it's just especially for a cryptocurrency something that was built to kind of be an opposite of that i think we see a lot of centrality sometimes when the founder becomes the face of a coin and they affect the price performance of the coin they you know go around traveling talking about the coin thank I think goodness my, my cardano bags are so much higher because charles streams every day <laughs> and honestly i am a fan of charles hoskinson i just don't think that his role in the Cardano ecosystem, like just being that much the front face and just that one person that so much relies upon, I, I personally don't like that. I don't like the hero mentality that you see in some of these crypto communities and the toxicity that actually comes from it as well. I just don't think you should blindly ever trust anybody. You should always question even your role mo models. Well, a prominent founder doesn't mean necessarily toxicity. Now, sometimes we do see that, but I mean, Gary, you jump in. Yeah, uh, in California, down through South America, there's something called El Camino Real or the King's Road. And, uh, you know, it's used today. You know, there's lots of cities built along it that's uh, maybe it's a 600 year old path. So, you know, the founder has a role. Uh, I think that they start uh, maybe with the characteristics of what they want that's different than the existing roads that may be available to peoples. Uh, so Bitcoin has its, uh, you know, origin story that led uh, technology forward, uh, pushed technology forward. and you know, people to have these kinds of conversations and decide what is money, what is value, uh, store a value on the internet, these kinds of things. So, and then other chains have come along. So you have a Vitalik or you have uh, other people that basically take derivatives or, or change some variable. Um, I, I do think that the culture can be set, maybe an origin story by a founder, but eventually the road needs to be used by the peoples. And if the peoples are moving cargo, uh, such as NFTs, they're, they're, they're setting contracts, that uh, reduce the overhead cost of lawyers. Uh, they have auto uh, automation built into it and things like that. I think that it's better use than simply promoting a single character, uh, you know, a, as an origin. The king has had a road. Satoshi will always be considered a mysterious, I think, mysterious and unknown entity or person. Uh, and, and you can reference the origin, uh, the reason for Satoshi to create Bitcoin. Um, but like at the end of the day, these networks are only useful uh, because people are using them uh, more so than simply the founder. And it makes it a lot easier for it to come crashing down when everyone is looking that single person. I mean, from personal experience, I've been on AMAs with, with, you know, with Charles. And all of a sudden, I didn't ask him a question. I asked a question to somebody else that was on the panel. And all of a sudden, they get offended. They're like, wait, you have a question for me? I'm busy. I, I'm going to get going soon. I'm like, is that really the attitude that we need in crypto? Or do we want to see... Wait, you, you said that's how Charles acted? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have it recorded somewhere. I got to look for it. It's hilarious. That's Charles for you. You know, we all, they all have their quirks, right? Exactly. And do, and do we need those quirks? Do we need that person that can make or break a blockchain? I don't think so. I think it's much better to put the power in the hands of the people. I don't know, actually. I saw him post a cool uh, picture of him meditating in a judo gi, and that kind of makes me really, um, you know, think that you might be wrong. Quick question, quick question for Tina and Boomerang. Tina, is, you're, you're taking the opinion that, you know, the central founders aren't that great, right? Yeah. Do you truly believe that, Tina? I think it's time you oh really God. disassociated yourself from Boomerang. <laughs> <laughs> do you see my profile pictures or do you see me flexing with my Louis Vuitton or Gucci bags on the Boomerang account? No. <laughs> Just kidding. I think this is a great place to wrap it up. I do want to, you know, hear from James, uh, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I've got one final thought is crypto is extremely cultish. It's extremely manipulated. And I would advise everybody here to spend time learning 
how to analyze human beings, how to discover sociopaths, psychopaths, and narcissists. And that will help you because when you identify who they are, then don't invest in coins that are run by these people. That is the most valuable thing I've ever said. On well, why Twitter just Spaces because they're a narcissist? Why is that like means they're going to like fuck up? Wouldn't that mean like, oh, they really like they, they, their, their reputation's on the line? Their focus is not on the game. You want to find a founder that has a mission. And the mission is not themselves, not their ego, not their fake intelligence or their fake university degrees or any of that shit. This is the most important thing people need to learn. And they don't. They follow blindly like sheep, just like the populace in a country that votes for certain people. That is the problem. All right. I, I'll leave it there. But if, if you're not smart enough to understand what I just said, then you're part of the 90 percent. Let, let, me, let me make a comment. Let me make this open comment. Uh, Edison is famous for being an asshole, uh, you know, electrocuting uh, elephants so he could promote that direct current was more popular and useful for households than, elect than uh, alternating current. So famously an asshole and famously a plagiarist. Uh, but you use light and you use a lot of the different technologies that came from that uh, origin story and the inventors underneath them. So at the end of the day, again, go to the King's Road. If the people have a use case for the road, uh, thousands of years later, hundreds of years later, you know, long after the King is gone, uh, then that's really ultimately what I'm fighting for. In yeah, pe people always use that Edison case. He did not personally electrocute a fucking elephant, okay? Get your facts I know, right. I know Somebody else did. I know the All right? I didn't say yeah. Okay, so so he, don't use that hired, as a case. Give me another case. Someone, Give me man. another case that proves your point. Steve Jobs? What, that, that, that inventors are different than the people that use the invention? What are you trying to say? No, you said Thomas Edison electrocuted elephants to make his point. That's what you said. He did not do that. Uh, let's carry on. I, we can talk. No, 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 no. I'm you're, very you're, pro I, I didn't, animals. I didn't, I didn't mean to say that he was the one. You said the Thomas frog. Edison electrocuted elephants. You can look at the history. I've heard this. I've done the history. I study history. That's how you identify where the future is going to go by studying history. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Let it go. I love it, guys. This is this is this is great. <laughs> this is literally the heated argument cat, that we love. Cat it. videos are popular on YouTube, man. <laughs> but I just anyways, want to, just want to jump in, say thank you, James, investor, answers, all coin boys. Thank you guys for putting this space up. Thank you guys. We appreciate you. Appreciate thank you. you for joining. Thank you to the audience. And if you liked what James and I feel like Aaron I feel like James say, James was getting mad at me the whole time, and he took it out on Gary last last second. Right? No, <laughs> no, Aaron. I, the fact that you took the bullets tonight, you earned respect, Aaron, from me. Oh, thanks, Take, man. Taking this, no, that that takes kahunas. So really, well impressed. Respect and I, I I I do get a little. You know, I haven't slept in like sixteen or twenty hours, but I, I get emotional about certain things. And that is probably the reason I make videos. Is and to be because, clear, and to be yeah. clear, Gary is not harming any elephants. Just to be clear, but thank you guys. <laughs> That's a topic for a different discussion. Tina, you want to close us out? I can make a lot of jokes here, but I just want to say thank you, everybody. Thank you for not, Doug. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but yeah, thank you so much. If you liked what you heard from Aaron, Invest Answers, give them both a follow. Genuinely, I would say these two are my top favorite content creators on YouTube. Um, but everybody else too, thank you, Gary, for joining and adding to the conversation. Action, Doug, everybody that joined, you guys really do um, help us with the show every week. Um, and it's been really fun hosting these for the past three months, I would say, I think. Um, and, you know, we're not going anywhere. So we're going to see you next Thursday. And until then, trade well, my friends. And thank you, everybody, again, for joining.